Good evening. I am Dr. Susan Shaw, the founder and director of the Shaw Institute, and I'm pleased to welcome you to our 2020 environmental webinar series, Planet in Crisis, Science and Survival. Today, Americans are well aware of the importance of science, of public health in our lives. We've designed this webinar series to bring to you directly the voices of leading scientists who are confronting the complex challenges we are facing. Climate change, plastic pollution, our oceans in crisis, and the COVID pandemic. Tonight's speaker is the acclaimed coral reef scientist, Dr. Nancy Nelson. She is looking at the fragile state of our oceans today with dying coral, collapsing fish populations, and acidic oceans choking with plastic. Have we inflicted permanent harm? Dr. Nelson thinks not, and brings this remarkable picture of resilience and recovery. Dr. Nancy Nelson is the Sant Chair Emerita for Marine Sciences at the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History. She is the founder of the Center for Marine Biodiversity and Conservation at Scripps Institution of Oceanography. She is also, excitedly, the 2020 Darwin Medalist for the International Coral Reef Society. And congratulations, Nancy. This is just such a fabulous award. Uh, I might add, she is also a member of our um, advisory board to the Shaw Institute. She's author of a beautiful book, Citizens of the Sea for All Ages. She's a former editor-in-chief of Smithsonian's Ocean Portal. Now, um, at the end of, the, of her talk, she will take questions, so please feel free during the talk to submit questions and comments. And if you have questions left over, Again, feel free to email those to us at the Shaw Institute. Now, I'm very pleased to welcome Dr. Nancy Nelson. Good evening. Thank you for joining us here uh, virtually. Uh, in some ways, it seems very strange to be talking uh, about the oceans with no audience. On the other hand, being able to address you all virtually means I can actually talk to many more of you. So thank you for joining us uh, this evening or this afternoon or morning, wherever you are. Uh, what I'd like to do today is tell you uh, really the journey of my personal journey uh, in terms of understanding the ocean. I'll call this talk Our Ocean Planet in Three Acts. I'll begin with the staggering diversity that characterizes life in the ocean. It's really how I started my career. And then I'll turn uh, to, uh, for a few minutes, but not for most of the talk, to some of the scary news we've been hearing and actually have been hearing for quite some time about the health of the ocean. I'm sure many of you are, have also been hearing the same news. And because we've heard much of the news about the state of the ocean being bad, what I'd like to spend most of my time uh, this afternoon uh, is talking to you about reasons for hope, some of the good news about ocean conservation that's happening right now. So let's begin with the staggering diversity. As Susan mentioned, I'm a coral reef scientist, and coral reefs are actually the epicenter of diversity uh, in the ocean. It's amazing uh, when you swim on a coral reef, you often see a site like what you see here on the, on the slide on the right hand side. Uh, vigorous coral growing, lots of different fish, or at least certainly that was the way it was when I started my career. Uh, and those are just the conspicuous parts of the diversity, uh, the things that you can see easily. Actually, most of the diversity uh, is stuff that you can't really see that easily. Uh, one example you see on the left, those are um, cowrie shells. Uh, some of you may know them as money shells. They were actually used as money in parts of the Pacific Ocean uh, culturally uh, some time ago. And even that one tiny group, which is one, one of many, many groups of snails, which is one of many, many groups of marine organisms, has literally hundreds of species. So there are, there's a huge amount of diversity in the ocean, and particularly uh, in tropical waters. Now some of that diversity is really big, as you see here in this beautiful photograph by Brian Sc uh, Scarry from National Geographic of uh, him with a, uh, a whale in uh, Antarctic waters. But much of the diversity is actually quite small. 
And what you see here is a photo montage of um, diversity that was contained in just a cubic foot of coral reef on the island of Morea in the Central Pacific. Again, this is taken by a photographer, uh, David Lichfager, not a scientist, but he put all the photographs together of the creatures he found in one cubic foot and put them in this montage. And, and most of these organisms are very, very tiny, an inch or, uh, or less in length. And you can see all sorts of different kinds, tiny, not only tiny fish, but also shrimp and worms and crabs and starfish, uh, really all sorts of diversity. And this is, this is where the, most of the diversity uh, in the ocean actually is, is with these tiny things. Now, even for the big things, which we, you, you might think we know reasonably well, in fact, we're still discovering lots of new species. And on the right, you see a new species of killer whale, uh, or orca. Uh, we used to think there was just one species, but it turns out they're divided into several species. They have very tiny differences in color pattern, but big differences in diet. And on the left, you see uh, a stamp issued by the Indonesian government in honor of a new species of coelacanth. Now, coelacanths are amazing fish. They're called lobefin fish, and they're actually much more closely related to us than most of the fish uh, in the ocean. And that's because those lobe fins are what uh, gave rise ultimately uh, to our arms and legs. So they're completely uh, homologous in terms of their evolutionary origin. Now, Lobefin fishes were thought to have gone extinct about the time of the dinosaurs, 66 million years ago. Uh, but in 1938, uh, a species was brought in by a fisherman, and it was uh, recognized that this species was actually still alive in the Indian Ocean. All right, well enough, it's alive in the Indian Ocean. But uh, fast forward 60 years, and a, a young scientist couple, actually on their honeymoon in Indonesia, were walking by a fish market and discovered a new species of coelacanth sitting right in front of them in the fish market in Indonesia uh, in about 1997. And so now there are two species of coelacanths. Uh, amazing that we didn't even know they existed uh, uh, until relatively recently. Now, as a result of all this unknown diversity it's been uh, that we keep discovering bits and pieces of, it's now recognized that perhaps as much as 90% of the organisms that live in the ocean have never been studied by scientists. They have no official name. And you see here two examples of species that were just described this year by scientists uh, as new. And uh, both of them are from the deep sea. There are lots of unknown species in the deep sea because the deep sea is so big and so hard to study. On the left, you see a amphipod, it's a shrimp-like creature, and it's named uh, Eurythenes plasticus because of the discovery not only of it, but a lot of plastic in the deep sea as well. And on the right, you see a new species of scale worm. Those are those beautiful iridescent patches you see on the back of this worm. Now, I'm not gonna try to pronounce its genus name, but it's uh, species name is Elvisi, and it's named after Elvis in honor of the brightly colored suits that uh, Elvis Presley uh, used to wear during his performances. Now this diversity is more than just entertaining and uh, intriguing, it actually is incredibly important. And on the left you see a picture of a bacterium called Prochlorococcus marinus. And the interesting thing about this is this species was only discovered in 1988. And what makes that amazing is the fact that it contains 60% of the ocean's chlorophyll. So you may have heard that uh, every other breath you take comes from the ocean. Well, every fourth breath you take comes from this creature whose existence was unknown to scientists until 1988. And on the right-hand side, you see pictures of cone snails. Now, there are about five or 600 species of cone snail, and each of them uh, they're predatory animals and they have a, a cocktail of toxins they use to incapacitate and kill their prey. Now what's interesting about these toxins uh, is that they, in small doses, uh, can be very useful medically. Now in large doses, uh, they can be fatal even to humans. There are some cone snails that are capable of killing people. But in tiny, tiny doses, these toxins can be very, very helpful medically. One of them is a pain reliever, which is already approved for use and on sale. It's a thousand times more powerful than morphine. But others of these toxins are also being developed for treatment of everything from uh, Alzheimer's disease to heart attacks. So these, this diversity is important, not only in terms of the general sense of uh, maintaining the web of life in the ocean, but to us medically. 
The ocean diversity also inspires us uh, and lets us think about new ways of doing things. And here you see two, the examples of two discoveries made just this week. On the left hand side you see a picture of a deep sea fish and it's uh, what was discovered was that these fish are so black they have kind of ultra black pigment so that almost no light ex escapes their tissues. Now the picture you see that looks like light is reflecting is actually a computer altered version of it uh, so that you can actually see the fish because if you take just a regular old photograph of this fish. It looks like that inset in the right. It's just a black silhouette. You can't see any details at all. It's literally a biological black hole. Light almost doesn't escape at all from these specimens. And it's been thought that it, help, that it helps them evade detection in the deep sea, but what's interesting is that the structure that they use to create this ultra black characteristic uh, is actually quite, it's quite sophisticated but relatively simple and it's been um, it's thought now with this discovery that it could be that same principles could be used to create black coatings on the insides, for example, of cameras and telescopes that are uh, relatively inexpensive to produce. And on the right, you see a picture of an abalone. Now, you all know about abalone in terms of a potential item on the dinner table, but what's really interesting about abalone shells is that they are very, very difficult to break or cut into. And engineers using the structure of that inside layer of the abalone have created a new material that is literally uncuttable. And needless to say, things that can't be cut are incredibly important in terms of creating ultra strong materials and, uh, and things that can be used in uh, defense. Of course, finally, as a, someone who just loves the ocean, just as ocean creatures uh, being inspiring, I share with you three pictures that have been uh, of organisms that were discovered in the course of work uh, with, uh, that I did with colleagues. And to me, these organisms are inspiring just by virtue of their simple beauty. Now, of course, as, as I mentioned, and as I'm sure most of you know, there's more to the ocean story than simply its staggering diversity. There's also some really scary news. And uh, there's been so much scary news building over the last several decades that sometimes it's hard to know which direction to go, it's either doom or gloom, no matter where you look. And I personally experienced that sense of doom and gloom very early on in my career. As I mentioned, I'm a coral reef biologist and I began my career on the north coast of Jamaica. And you see here a picture that I took in 1975 of what the reefs used to look like back then. Now, even then, these reefs were not in perfect condition. And you can tell that by what's not in the picture. What's not in the picture are any big fish. So we knew the fish were missing, and that's because Jamaica, even then, was a very poor country, and fishermen literally had to take everything they could out of the ocean just to feed their families. But we didn't worry about the corals themselves, which in this photograph you can see literally covering the bottom. All those heads and branches are all living coral. Now that assumption that the absence of fish really didn't matter in terms of the health of the corals turned out to be sadly very mistaken. And 10 years after I began my work in Jamaica, the reefs looked like what you see on the right. There was almost no living coral left. Went from about 70% living coral on the bottom to less than 5%, and the bottom was covered with smothering seaweeds. And of course, this bad news has continued uh, since 1985, and it's not just coral reefs. Here you see headlines collected over the last uh, year or so, everything from the loss of oxygen in the ocean to pollution creating dead zones to fish losing their ability to smell as a consequence of the changing ocean chemistry to the slowing down of ocean currents and a, and a simple map that shows essentially every single part of the ocean has been impacted by people. So there's plenty of bad news to go around and as, I'm sh as, I'm, as I said I'm sure many of you listening have read about this bad news. Essentially every day you can find a piece of bad news about the ocean in the, in the papers or other media. So that is why I want to uh, perhaps surprisingly conclude uh, this talk and spend most of my time actually talking about reasons for hope. Because we have so much evidence of bad things happening, I think it's time to also talk about some of the positive things that are occurring so, occurring so that we don't get so discouraged that we don't continue to work on ocean conservation at all. And the, I'll start with some examples of protecting ocean spaces. 
So here you see two places that I've been uh, lucky enough to visit or at least get near to. One on the left is tropical and one on the right is obviously not, is Antarctica. And those are both examples of really large protected areas, marine protected areas or MPAs as they're sometimes called, that have been established to protect uh, life in those regions. And in the Line Islands, for example, you can go diving and see really big fish. In fact, the fish, the sharks, turtles, the sharks in particular are large enough and numerous enough that after about four o'clock you really don't want to be in the water diving because um, uh, you might wind up on the menu for the sharks that are around. So uh, this is an example of a truly protected area, spectacular diversity. And on the right you see a picture of the Ross Sea, the largest marine protected area anywhere on the planet. Uh, and it is uh, home to spectacular wildlife, both uh, on top of the uh, surface of the ocean and also uh, beneath it. But it doesn't have to be big, remote places like the Lion Islands or the, um, or the Ross Sea in order to make it worthwhile to protect. And here you see two other places that I've been lucky enough to visit uh, that are really small urban spaces, which in, nevertheless provide really important habitat for the species that depend on them. On the left you see a estuary near the uh, city of Lisbon in Portugal, which is the home of many, many migrating birds, some of which you see in that photograph. And on the right you see a small park squeezed in between Hong Kong and Shenzhen. These are cities that between them have 19 million people, and yet this tiny little park, Maipo Park, is home to 60,000 birds representing 350 different species. So these are tiny spaces, spaces, but nevertheless very important to protect. And in total, in the last 20 years, we've increased the amount of protection from about 3.2 million square kilometers to 26.9 uh, million square kilometers. That's about 77% 7 of the surface of the ocean, a little over 7%. Now that's not enough, but there are plans afoot to increase that uh, hopefully up to 30% of the ocean being protected by 2030. I'd like now to turn to some of the examples of really spectacular recoveries that have happened as a consequence of our taking action to protect particular ocean species. And the first is uh, our species that, at least for the respect to the ospreys, are very common here on the coast of Maine, uh, where I'm speaking from, but also Pelicans. These are both examples of birds of prey, coastal birds of prey, that were desperately harmed by pesticides, in particular DDT. And as Rachel Carson uh, so powerfully argued in her book Silent Spring, which was really the beginning of the modern environmental movement, um, these birds were being poisoned by DDT. It was accumulating up the food chain, which is why top predators were so severely affected. And for birds, the effects were particularly dramatic because it caused the egg shells to become so thin that when the parents sat on the eggs, they cracked and, the, and the, all the babies died. Now, as a consequence of Rachel Carson's book and the actions of others to uh, amplify the message, DDT was banned in 1972. The result is that now, if you go on the coast of Florida, you can see lots of pelicans. If you go on the coast of Maine, you can see lots and lots of ospreys. So many, in fact, that I would argue that most people have no idea that the reason those birds are so abundant now is because of actions we took in the 1970s to protect them by banning DDT. The second example, again from the coast of Maine, concerns the recovery of puffins. Puffins are quintessentially cute birds. They are the source of a lot of uh, touristic activities here on Maine. But uh, at the beginning of the uh, 20th century, in the 19, about 1900, all but one, there was only one pair of breeding puffins left in Maine. And that's because they had been overhunted, both for the puffins and their eggs. Now there was a, a law passed, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, which protected them from hunting. But uh, what happened after the law was that the puffins really didn't recover and it took the scientific insight of uh, Dr. Stephen Kress uh, working with the Audubon Society who realized that all these empty rocks on the coast of Maine where puffins used to nest that because they were empty the puffins were reluctant to come back. Puffins were essentially a little bit like people. They like to have other puffins around. If there's no puffins on the rock they basically conclude that there's something wrong with the rock. So to correct this problem, he 
put wooden puffin statues on the rocks. He played puffin calls and he brought a few baby puffins to jumpstart the process. And the result is now there are hundreds and hundreds of breeding puffins on the coast of Maine. It's a source of, as I mentioned, a big tourism industry. And these methods have worked not only in puffins, but many, many kinds of seabirds, which like puffins, breed in large colonies and are reluctant to start colonies in places where there are no members of their own species. Now I'd like to turn to the story of the recovery of sea turtles. I'm sure many of you heard that sea turtles uh, were, are in terrible shape, and in fact, they are all still endangered. But what's worth remembering is that of the 17 populations of sea turtles in the world, 12 of those 17 populations, the green circles that you see here, are increasing. And those increases are due to the really heroic efforts of people around the world to protect eggs from poaching on beaches and also reduce the probability of turtles getting caught in, in fishing nets. And some of these population increases are really enormous. For example, the green turtles on the coast of Florida have been have increased by over a thousand percent. So really, really big increases. Some of the turtle populations are still declining and some of the increases are more modest, but we've had real success where we put our minds to it. Here's a story about the recovery of seagrass in Tampa Bay. Now, Tampa Bay uh, used to have lots and lots of seagrass, which is really important for, as a habitat for uh, small fish. And, uh, but the problem is it's sensitive to pollution and disturbance. And so by the 1970s, most of the seagrass in Tampa Bay had disappeared. On the right, you see the map in red, which shows where the seagrass remained after all those years of uh, pollution. However, the citizens of Tampa Bay decided they didn't like having no seagrass and they took a lot of steps to improve the quality of the water. And the result was that several years ago it was announced that Tampa Bay seagrasses have returned to 1950s levels. Now this is a remarkable success story. And what's even more remarkable about the success in, in a way is that when I started talking about the success, most people had never heard about it, including even most marine conservationists, which is one of the things that made me realize that it was really important to talk about the successes. What good is a success apart from the success itself if it can't be used as a source of inspiration and learning to generate more successes around the world? I'd like to turn now to fishing uh, because we take uh, a lot of fish from the ocean. We use the ocean to feed our a large population of humans around the world, and it's important that we do this wisely. Here's an example from Southern California, where there used to be a, a habit of laying out gill nets in really shallow water. Now the problem of putting gill nets in shallow water is that the big uh, fish go to shallow water in order to spawn. And so the result was that uh, the fishermen were catching not only fish, but they were catching the the organisms, of the individuals that were really needed to make the next generation of fish that they wanted to catch. And so in 1994, they banned laying uh, uh, gill nets in shallow water. And the result has been a remarkable recovery, uh, both in terms of the commercial catch, which you see in the graph, but also in the recreational fishing as well, as you can see by that happy angler on the right. We've also gotten better at reducing bycatch. I mentioned bycatch in the context of turtles, the problem of their being caught in fishing uh, nets. In addition, uh, a lot of fishing activity is very potentially very dangerous to seabirds because they get attracted by the bait at the ends of these fishing lines and uh, swallow the bait and then are hooked and drowned. One positive thing that's been developed is the use of what are called bird scaring lines, which you see these red lines hanging down in this image. Those lines are actually quite effective at keeping birds away from uh, hooked uh, bait and have reduced the amount of bycatch uh, quite remarkably in some areas. I'd like to talk uh, about restoration now. And restoration is really important because as I mentioned, we've done, managed to do a lot of damage to the world's oceans. And so we can't simply just protect things and uh, uh, harvest wisely and reduce pollution. We also, in some cases, have to actively work to restore conditions to uh, make them better so that the recovery will take place in a reasonable, uh, at a reasonable rate. So here's an example again from Maine, um, here near where I, very near where I live. In fact, that picture on the right I took of a small stream uh, where the dam, which had been in place but was really doing nothing except for uh, getting in the way of fish migrating upriver to spawn, was uh, removed. 
And so as a result of that restoration, and this has occurred not only on that little stream, but in streams across the state of Maine, has been the dramatic recovery of alewives, the fish you see on the left. Now alewives can be eaten by humans, but they're also eaten by a lot of other parts of the marine ecosystem, bald eagles, uh, large predatory fish. And so restoring the alewives is the first step towards restoring a lot of other aspects of the Maine ocean ecosystem. And it's been a huge success. You can now stand by those uh, streams and watch during the spawning season, literally an alewife jumping off the stream every second or two. A huge number of alewives were before there were none. It's also possible to restore mangroves. Here you see an example of a project being carried out by the Zoological Society of London in the Philippines. And you see here a photograph on the left and taken in 2007 of a small community of people planting small mangroves. By five years later, in 2012, what you see is a mangrove forest. So if done properly, and it's important that it be done properly, you can do mangrove replanting or any other kind of replanting incorrectly and not get much of a result. But if you do it correctly, well informed by science, you can get remarkably quick results. And mangroves are some of our biggest restoration success stories. You can also restore our beaches. And in this case, the problem is human uh, plastic, human debris. This is a story uh, that's uh, of restoration that took place on a beach near Mumbai, the uh, very, very large city in India. And it was an effort led by a lawyer named Afro Shaw, who has, as he said, um, he could have just sued the government to get them to work on cleaning up the beach, but he said, he decided, you know, this is my ocean, I'm gonna do something personally. And he and his elderly neighbor went out and started picking up plastic from the beach. Now, of course, two of them can't pick up that much plastic, but over the weeks and months that followed, more and more people joined them, so that within three years, 22,000 tons of plastic trash were removed from the beach, from Versova Beach in Mumbai. And the result has been a transformation from a plastic covered beach, which you see on the left, to turtles returning to that beach to spawn as a result of its restoration, thanks to the efforts of Afros, who is now working on a lot of other similar projects around India. Now, it's important to recognize that it's not just plants and animals that benefit from these efforts. It's also people and people's livelihoods and well-being. And here you see uh, illustrations from an example of a place called Cabo Pulmo. You see it, that star at the bottom of Baja, California. And on the left you see the individual who's a senior figure in the community uh, who really spearheaded the effort to transform his fishing community, which was suffering terribly from overfishing. Essentially, they were fishing harder and harder for fewer and fewer fish. Uh, he decided, and with the support of the community, to stop fishing altogether in part of the area and set up a park instead. The result has been a spectacular rebound in the, the amount of fish, so that, but not only is fishing better so that these people can uh, eat something when they go fishing, but the result has been the creation of such spectacular underwater vistas that now the primary income, which is much more substantial than any income that could be derived from fishing, comes from tourism. If you go online and look for um, Cabo Pulmo uh, for tourism, you'll see many, many offers of places uh, to stay that take advantage of this spectacular recovery, uh, all spearheaded by this tiny, impoverished fishing community that decided they could do better. It's also important to think about restoring human health and dignity. And this is an example of a company started by uh, a young uh, engineer who was really distressed by sewage pollution. And the problem with sewage in the developing countries is that there just isn't enough money to lay down the equivalent of sewer pipes like ours exist in many cities in the United States. So it, it really wasn't financially feasible in the slums uh, of African cities to do this. And so what he came upon instead was the idea of installing these clean uh, public toilet facilities as alternatives to the things that you see on the lower left, which was basically a situation where people uh, went to the bathroom and that what they uh, deposited in the bathroom soon wound it up in the river and then on into the ocean. So he created these clean uh, blue, bright blue, uh, 
facilities. They were owned by local people, so they got some income from it, and they were responsible for keeping them clean. Then, on a regular basis, the waste deposited in these toilets uh, was trucked away, turned into organic fertilizer, and then uh, distributed to organic farms uh, in the area surrounding the city of Nairobi. So here you see a wonderful example of what we call a win-win-win, where not only is the water cleaner, but the sanitation is better, uh, people are making an income, and they're even, as a result, producing something that's useful uh, to the agricultural community. Now, I haven't said much about energy, uh, but it is, of course, the big elephant in the room because climate change is the thing that will really upend all of these local efforts if we don't come to grips with it. But I have to say that the last several years have really given me hope. There's plenty of bad, bad news out there about what's going on with respect to greenhouse gas emissions, but we are in the midst of an energy revolution that was simply not predicted five years ago. It is now the case that in most parts of the planet, renewable energy is cheaper than fossil fuel-based energy. So at my home, which you see on the left, I have solar panels, I have an electric car, and so as I joke with my husband, we drive on sunbeams. We never use any fossil fuels at all when we drive. But the more important story is what you see on the right, the massive upscaling of renewable energy capability, which in this particular case of this installation, capable of powering not just my home, but 590,000 homes. And then here's a revolution that we're not, we're not there yet. It's just starting uh, to, to really start to grow. And that's the problem with plastic. And in fact, this is a problem that the um, pandemic has made worse because of the proliferation of all these single-use plastics as a way of reducing the potential for uh, passing on the virus. But there are even in the plastic situation where there's really much more bad news than good news still, there are promising signs of hope. So on the left you see a picture of me, it was taken in Tanzania. I'm holding a glass, a reusable bottle, and a, pl a bag that is not a plastic bag. As you, if you travel to Tanzania, you'll see on the application for a visa that plastic bags are not allowed in the country. And in fact, you risk a serious fine or perhaps worse if you bring plastic bags into Tanzania. So that's an example of a country that's really starting to come to terms with plastic. In Baltimore, you see here a picture of Mr. Trash Wheel. Turns out most of the plastic, plastic that gets into the ocean comes via rivers. And so this is a promising uh, new way of focusing on those points where a, a small effort can make a big difference by picking up the trash in the river before it gets into the ocean where it's much, much harder to collect. And then finally, there are all sorts of new developments uh, in, in process in terms of creating plastics for single uses that are not indestructible. If you have a single use plastic, the last thing you want is a plastic that lasts in the ocean for 100 or 500 years. You want it to di disintegrate in the course of uh, months to years, uh, certainly not hundreds of years to uh, millennia. And there are a lot of different products being developed. You see here just a picture of one, uh, the winner of the James Dyson Award uh, for a plastic that is uh, made sustainably and uh, also biodegrades relatively quickly. Now, I've given you a lot of examples of good news and I don't want you to think that I think everything is just fine. Quite the contrary. And I'm, so I'm not saying that the bad news and the setbacks and the trade-offs and the horrifying projections that we hear on a daily basis are invalid. They're not. They're very, very valid. And we have to take what we're doing now, these signs of hope, and scale them up dramatically. Here's an example uh, of one which I think is, is one of the things that's so frustrating uh, about working in this field. It's an article that appeared in the Washington Post. And what they show is a picture of this toxic sludge uh, washing into beautiful waters on the coast of Indonesia, some of the richest coral reefs in the world. And that toxic sludge comes from mining heavy metals, which are used to make the batteries of my electric car. So there are a lot of problems that we have to solve still, and this is just one, of the, one example. And so I'm not trying to deny the existence of these problems or the gravity of the threat or the scale of the effort that will be required. Nevertheless, if all you do is talk about doom and gloom, it becomes self-fulfilling, and this kind of negativity is incredibly sticky when talking to uh, other people about the situation. 
Uh, if people, so, social scientists have actually known for a long time, if you give people a huge problem with no solutions, they tend to turn to apathy rather than action because they feel that there is nothing that can be done, as illustrated in this lovely, depressing comic from the New Yorker, making a difference doesn't make a difference. Making a difference does make a difference. It's important to talk about it. And moreover, it's what people have also come to realize that if you talk, if you talk to people about negative news, it sticks in their brain much more strongly than positive news. And once that negative news is in the brain, it's actually hard to overturn it with positive news, whereas it's very easy to overturn positive news with negative news. And that's why I have argued for the last decade about the importance of reframing the conservation conversation. So we've spent decades, literally decades, talking about dead zones, extinction, overfishing, and acidification. And that's fine, and we need to keep doing it. But we also need to talk about examples where water has gotten cleaner, where species have recovered, where areas have been protected, and where green energy has the potential to make a huge difference. And that is what I'm asking uh, others to do, and it's why I give talks like the one I'm giving now, because I think this message is so important. I think one of the things we've learned in the last five years in particular is that change can come quickly and, some, and from some unlikely sources. There's a wonderful African proverb that reads, if you think you are too small to make a difference, you haven't spent the night with a mosquito. Or, I would argue, Greta Thunberg. It's important to recognize that this change really can happen, that individuals can make a difference, not only on their own, but by persuading others to make a difference, which eventually uh, makes policy changes as well. And there's another quote, which I think is really important to remember, is from Bill Gates. He says, we always overestimate the amount of change that will take place in two years. So we start working on something and it just seems much, much harder and harder than we ever expected. We don't seem to be making any progress. But the second half of that quote is, but we always underestimate the amount of change that will take place in 10 years. And that's what I think we're seeing now on all sorts of fronts, including uh, the green energy revolution. So I'd like to close with, uh, uh, encourage you to Think about the good news as well as the bad. Be informed about what's working as well as what's not. Uh, if you go on Twitter, you can follow hashtag Ocean Optimism, which is a hashtag that I and others uh, launched in 2014. It's since been used by over 45,000 different, 45, different Twitter accounts. And if you're looking for some good news, you can uh, go on Twitter and search for that hashtag and you're bound to find some. And actually, this has since been expanded to hashtag Earth Optimism as well, if you want some good news about what's happening on the land. So with that, I think I'll close and take any questions that you might have. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Nancy, for an exciting and informative talk. And it's so nice to have a positive message. Please join us again on August 5th for my talk, Plastics, Politics, and Public Health. <laughs>